few words about Professor Prabal Sen. Professor Prabal Sen is a professor at XLRI in the economics area and is the chairperson of Entrepreneurship Development Center of the XLRI Jamshedpur. Before joining XLRI in 2007, Professor Sen served the Institute of Rural Management on an IMA as Bank of Board Chair Professor and has earlier taught at the postgraduate Department of Economics in Woodman University and served a public sector bank for over two decades where he had occupied senior management positions in areas related to economic research, general management and rural policy planning and operations. As the chairperson EDC at Accelerate, Professor Sen was instrumental in launching a new full-time academic program for Certificate in Entrepreneurship Management, PGP CEM, in 2009. He has been conferred the Best Teacher Award by the Higher Education Forum of India in 2011 for his outstanding contribution in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship. I'd like to call upon Professor Prabhu Sen to start the session. This session is dedicated to deliberation of the subject related to promotion of entrepreneurship at the grassroots level. Now, uh, I sometimes feel that uh, if I have to prioritize the issues which are important in uh, promoting rural development in our country, I think uh, one of the items which will appear at the top would be promoting entrepreneurship. But then there is no unanimity on what entrepreneurship really means. Uh, I think many of you would agree with me that entrepreneurship is something which comes from the fire in the belly. It doesn't come from a, an intellectual understanding of the need for promoting intellect, entrepreneurship. And in our country uh, today, because the the scope for wage employment is shrinking. There is increasing significance of promoting entrepreneurship, self-employment ventures of you know livelihood. And entrepreneurship <coughs> is useful because one who becomes an entrepreneur, he is not standing in the queue for seeking jobs. He is one who is creating jobs for himself as well as, you know, others. But then an entrepreneur, unlike a wage employee, should have certain attributes in him to be successful. For instance, he must be determined to achieve his goal. And he must not drift from his, you know, mission. And again, you know, another trait which will make an entrepreneur successful and absence of which will make him a miserable, you know, uh, a person in the attempt to become an entrepreneur is, you know, the acceptance of the fact that risks are part of life, failures are part of life. A successful entrepreneur must always recognize that entrepreneurship is like a war which consists of not one but many battles. He may lose one battle here and win another battle there, but he must have the determination to continue to fight and be victorious in the war. And my feeling is that if one is consistent and honest in one's endeavors, then in the in the in the long run he will certainly be you know victorious. That is what is the story of an entrepreneur. Now today, amidst us, we have three very illustrious you know uh, participants in this session. One is Lakshmi B. Venkateshan. She is the founder, trustee, and chief executive officer of uh, Bharatiya Yuva Shakti Trust. She has done quite a lot in creating, you know, jobs in the rural areas. And what is more is that she has been instrumental in promoting at least 70,000 young entrepreneurs. She had studied in Delhi University and also in New York. And uh, she has two master's degree 
one in physics, another in engineering science, and she was a corporate person like I am. But then she was with AT&T, she was with Bell Laboratories USA, but then finally perhaps she thought that she can do something meaningful only if she comes to the you know, area of social entrepreneurship and uh, today she is on the board of quite a few important uh, bodies constituted by the government of India and she is also a member of the Committee on Affirmative Action CII. Now I am sure that we will uh, hear very interesting things about what is happening in the field of promotion of entrepreneurship in the country. We have with us this uh, morning K.C. Mishra. He is the founder director of e Kutir Social Business. He has also studied in Delhi as well as abroad and uh, uh, he is an honorary trustee to Global Knowledge Partnership Federation and an advisor to POP Hub. And uh, he believes in the, uh, doing something which is uh, ICT enabled and uh, which, uh, uh, which, which is based on ICT solutions. And uh, then we have with us Nishutu Duaro, he is founder and chief executive officer of Entrepreneurs Associates. He comes from Nagaland and uh, he has uh, brought about livelihood opportunities for about 3,200 farmers in Nagaland and uh, he had taught at the Baptist College Kohima and currently he is a guest faculty on entrepreneurship in many insti uh, prestigious institutions. In 2001, he was the first from the state of Nagaland to receive the International Ashoka Fellow. Now, I open the house, I open the floor to the distinguished speakers. First, Lakshmi B. Venkatesh. Thank you, Professor Sen. First and foremost, I hope everyone is awake after their cup of coffee and tea. Good. Because entrepreneurs are a very fiery lot, and so if you want to learn about them, you also have to have that same passion and energy to do so. I'm extremely happy to be here because, quite frankly, when we are asked to address many entrepreneurship forums, the social entrepreneurship is usually a section or a lecture in the whole context of economic entrepreneurship. So to have an entire conference focused on these kind of grassroots issues and social entrepreneurship is exceedingly interesting even for me to attend, even not to speak at. So I'm delighted that. And of course, any time when young people get together and organize something as impressive as this, uh, since I work with youth all the time, it also has an enormously uh, pleasing uh, effect. So on both accounts, I'm delighted to be here. <coughs> Professor Sen laid the framework very nicely for who and what we need in this country in terms of entrepreneurship. You look at uh, Sharad Tandale in September of last year, he stepped out of his village in Pune for the very first time in his life, stepped into the St. James Palace in London to be felicitated by His Royal Highness as well as receive the award. He had beaten out uh, candidates from 40 other countries uh, to win, become the Youth Entrepreneur of the Year 2013. Sharad came to us in uh, Bharti Vashakti Trust in uh, about two and a half years ago. He comes from the Varjari community in Maharashtra, which has got 10 million uh, tribal uh, people with three entrepreneurs, and Sharad is one of them. That is the kind of challenging environment he comes from. And when he came to us, the kind of initiatives he had taken. Entrepreneurship is not about creating an economic venture. Entrepreneurship is not about uh, starting something 
uh, from scratch. When you reach a certain age and you decide that you want to set up a business, entrepreneurship is to some extent any and everything you do, whether as a student, whether as a, as a, as a, as a young uh, person, whether it's in your family, in the community. So Sharad was one of them. And when he came to us, we, along with the uh, community of people that we support, the mentors, the bankers, and so on, found that we could trust him with a loan of 10 lakhs simply because he had shown initiative all of his life. Now what did he do with that 10 lakhs? He happened to create the one and only infrastructure company at that level, meaning he was here competing with the Larson and Tubros in terms of how to lay village roads and so on, but he came out much more cost effective. And that 10 lakhs has become in about two and a half years uh, close to 12 and a half crores and going on to 22 crores, which is what his uh, projected turnover is at the end of uh, uh, March 2014. Who is Sharad Tandale? Why is it that he was able to uh, get to where he was, from where he was to where he is today? He's got, he's employed over 120 people. And when you go and see the kind of work conditions that he offers all of his employees, it's amazing. He is in the business, as I said, of infrastructure. So what does that really mean? He uh, digs ditches, he lays cables, he erects uh, uh, towers for all kinds of uh, uh, telecommunications and other things. He builds tanks, water tanks, uh, he lays down pipes. So he provides an end-to-end infrastructure support. Now, why and how is Sharad Tandale important in the context of the Pune Municipal Corporation, who is one, uh, uh, one of his clients? Because Sharad does what nobody else does in that neighborhood. Either they have to go to big companies or they have to go to individual contractors to make this happen. Sharad brought this all under one head and he managed to provide this at a very cost effective way. Now, when you go and see his ditch diggers, they're a happy lot, all wearing hard head hats, all wearing gloves, and they look like someone who really are the workers of a very uh, formal sector business uh, and perhaps one of the most socially conscious business. I wouldn't even say just formal sector, socially conscious business. And when you talk about the hundred and uh, odd uh, people that he's employed, you will find that for him, growth has been one of the easiest things to do because he knows how to manage these people. And Sharad has been able to show his Varjari community that nothing can stop them from doing what he has done. So in all ways, Sharad has taken an initiative, not just for himself, but I would say he's a proto. I loved what I heard in the previous session about who is a proto and how he do that. He's a proto. Because he brought about the change within himself and he brought about the change within his community and in turn the community has brought about the change in him. Who are these people that we are really trying to support? I mean, we talk about a lot of youth, so many people, you know, 750 million people are under the age of uh, 35 and between 18 and 35 we have 400 million. We keep hearing all these numbers. But when you talk entrepreneurship, and once again, that's the reason why I love this conference and this session so much, is that when I talk or when we talk about entrepreneurship in a general forum, people talk about either you have your subsistence uh, microfinance uh, uh, kind of models, which is of course very important and effective at one level, and then you have the techpreneurs. What happens to the Sharat Tandalis? These are the people with the fire in the belly. These are the people who are capable of doing so much more. They're not waiting for a handout and they're not waiting for a job. But they don't have the ecosystem. They don't have what it takes. So the missing middle, and they, unfortunately, I coined this word in 2004, and since then uh, at one of the Standard Charter Bank uh, conferences on entrepreneurship, and since then I find that a lot of places use this word missing middle, but you come back to the fact they still seem to be missing. As far as services and support for these people go, the missing middle continues to be uh, not there. Now, once again, it was interesting in the context of pyramids and who is in a pyramid and so on, and I love the picture of what really a pyramid is today. But really, if it is a sustainable pyramid, in other words, 
Someone like Shana Tandale comes in as an income generator, but he doesn't remain there. He becomes a self-employment guy, and he doesn't remain there. He becomes an entrepreneur. He in turn creates a whole lot of people who then come in as an income generation. So if you see a pyramid as not essentially as who's sitting on the top, but how do we pe uh, move people up the value chain? That's really what we need. So once again, I think uh, uh, in the previous session, the moderator was making a very good point that we become uh, uh, a sector, the social sector, or even a country of numbers. Numbers is of course important. You need to know that what you're doing has impact. But then the stories of the Shadow Tandalis, the impact of what exactly others can do to emulate them, comes from that kind of qualitative data. So we go out of our way to create that kind of qualitative data, which is really what inspires another person. If I say, I come into a village and I say, okay, the next village has created 25 entrepreneurs, you too can do that, well, that's at one level. But when I took Sharat Tandale to Assam, when I'm in Gavati, when we started the program, there were so many people, young people like yourselves in the crowd, who came up and uh, told Sharat, if you can do it in Pune, we can do it in Gavati, just tell us what to do and how to go about it. That's really the power of what qualitative data and stories can happen. And the interesting thing is, Vaska uh, Damali is one such person. When we started the program, uh, I'll tell you a little bit of our history later on, but uh, essentially we had not taken up the challenge of Northeast, although we had started our program in 1992, till 2012. And when we did so, we often heard, well, the ecosystem is not exactly there, there's a lot of challenges, etc., etc. And for the first time, we also partnered with the state government. We tend to be primarily supported by the private sector, and that's the way it was, it was with the, right from the beginning. But in this case, we thought that we do need, for our scaling up purposes and for other reasons, uh, for the infrastructure to uh, join hands with the uh, Assamese government. And one of the things we were told is, oh, you must help these uh, people who are in bell metal works. Bell metal works is a, is a very traditional way of doing uh, metal forging and so on and so forth, and we were told it's a dying industry. So we said, well, rather than go in and say, how do you create uh, a change in an entire industry, let's see what we can do to create this entrepreneurship spirit first. Master Tamuli is one such person who was in that traditional uh, field of, uh, of uh, metal forging in the, in the well metal works. And it's amazing, I'm sorry, these two turned out in yellow and quite not showing up in this slide. But literally, we gave him the loan of seven lakhs about a year ago. Today, his turnover is, uh, is already two crores and is expected to be four crores. And he's employed close to 115 people. So when we had this conference uh, sometime last September, and when the Minister of Labor in Assam government came in, uh, he again made this comment. And then it was found himself in a sort of slightly embarrassing position because we didn't quite time it that way, but it so happened that the next speaker was Baska Tamuli, who came and talked about how he became a property in the bell metal works within less than a year. So in a way, it is interesting to see that these are the proofs of what, a, of, of what an ecosystem can do. What is this ecosystem we talk about? <laughs> Um, very often when we talk about, especially at the rural areas or in the grassroots level, um, there is a lot of issues that, that there is, there's a lot of way in which we differentiate. In many ways we talk down to our rural entrepreneurs or to the grassroots entrepreneurs. We are always providing them with solutions. I'll give you an example. When you go to banks, and there are many banks which has a whole lot of project reports. And for example, in SIDBI, the um, uh, Small Industrial Development Bank of India, whom we work with and partner with from time to time, one of the first things in the early years, I remember when we started, they said, you know, these entrepreneurs really don't know what to do. So why don't you go ahead and, and, and give them these project reports? We somehow went in there and they said, if we told them what to do, then they're going to keep coming back to us and say what to do next. But if we ask them what is their idea and how can they make it happen, then they are going to tell us what they need, which is easier to provide than to keep telling them what they have. So right from the beginning we said, I don't care who you are. I want you to tell me what is your idea. It may be zany, it may be completely off the, off the chart, it may be non-workable, but we don't care. Just tell us what's your idea. So starting from that process we found, 
that really if we treat entrepreneurs as entrepreneurs, you wouldn't dare go to Silicon Valley and ask, uh, give them a project report. You wouldn't even do that to a 17 or 18 year old uh, uh, who just joined Harvard and wants to uh, join the incubator or to an XLRI incubator session. Why would you do that to a lone entrepreneur? So from the beginning when we treated them as legitimate entrepreneurs with all the ideas, all we wanted to do was create the awareness about what it is and, and to some extent I wouldn't even call it training per se but it really is orienting them, counseling them uh, because they do know what they need to know. And then of course you have to provide access to finance and so on and so forth. At the heart of all of what we did was this mentoring. Mentors counsel, mentors select, mentors train, mentors support in, uh, in actually mentoring after the business takes off. The whole aspect of it revolves around this mentor-mentee relationship. A very proto world. I'm sorry, I just love what that uh, phenomenon was and I want to say that. So very much a question of uh, being able to relate to each other and what to do. And it is in this mentoring that we found that we were able to differentiate in terms of uh, our own product, our USP, but also in terms of really what is needed at the grassroots level. Uh, in, in the write-up that was given uh, as part of the uh, SLRI uh, brochure or the, uh, for the conference, I loved what they said. Um, I think what it said was that very often we think that uh, what entrepreneurs really need is access to finance or this thing, but really what they need is a proper ecosystem and you leave it to them and you make it happen. This is really what mentors do. And uh, even in a rural area, we will find that we are able to bring in uh, mentors through a mobile mentor clinic that actually goes to the doorstep of the villages. So we are not talking about suited, booted people who are mentors, who are business people, who are sitting there in glass buildings and the entrepreneurs happen to come there we ask the mentors to actually go to the doorstep of the entrepreneurs so that the entrepreneurs in turn feel empowered, feel knowledgeable and when they go to the villages very often we find the entire village turns up because they are very curious to know who are these people and why they are coming to talk to this very very small business guy and that in itself becomes a way in which awareness gets generated about what entrepreneurs can do. And coming back to this, this is the business idea context that we conduct and here is where I, I was talking about the fact that rather than tell them what to do, we ask them what's in your uh, mind. And it's amazing, we have conducted these kind of business idea contests in Rangareddy district in Andhra Pradesh, in the Pune district in Maharashtra, in Kanchipuram district in Tamil Nadu, wherever Haryana, Faridabad district in Haryana and so on. Every time we conduct it, we get a minimum of a thousand ideas from just one district alone. And we did that particularly in Kanchipuram district once we did 18 to 35, remember we have an age limit and then we said women only in that particular contest. We still got 800 ideas. What it means is this country, young people are not, uh, there's no dart of ideas. It's not that entrepreneurship is lacking because somehow we don't know what to do. We know what to do. Of course, out of that uh, contest and ideas and so on and so forth, we filter and filter and filter, maybe about 100 ideas are really workable. But just look at the mindset of the other 700, even if they did not have their ideas uh, win anything, they were able to see for themselves that their idea was worth something, that somebody was coming to them and saying, please tell us what you think and how you think. Nobody was telling them, sit in a class, listen to us, hear your entrepreneurship training, we'll tell you what is marketing 101, 2, 3, so on, and you go back and then you regurgitate. We are telling them, what is your idea? How do you want to make this happen? What do you think are the gaps? What do you need? So even apart from this business idea context, almost every training, every support that is given is really coming in terms of the initiative from the entrepreneur themselves. The other interesting idea is, very often when you talk about, in the original uh, situation, we gave our own finance because we had the corporate sector. But it was small, it wasn't scaling up. So you really needed to partner with the banks. But very often when we talk about the banks, we come back to the same issue. I may do all of this mentoring and Bharti Prashakti Trust may be supporting and so on and so forth with mentors like yourselves in the community mentoring them. But once they go to the bank, the banker is going back in many ways and saying, what's your project, why is it this way, what have you not done, and so on and so forth. They're talking their language. So we said, let's try and see whether we can come up with a common language. 
So in this process, the bankers of uh, or the banks with whom we are partnered with come together, mentors on one side who are industry people, bankers on one side uh, interviewing the entrepreneur at the same time. And what this does is, the bankers in many ways begin to see what the mentors are saying about the entrepreneur and the mentors are beginning to get some of the feel about what the uh, restraints and the constraints are for the bankers. But together, the entrepreneur is getting one voice, one answer, one solution. And when they leave, the bankers are not supposed to change their mind and if they do, they have to give it to us in writing as to why they approved it and then uh, change their mind later. And this has made a huge difference. Where we were lending one crore, we are lending 10 crores and we are, being, we are going to be lending 100 crores very soon on a yearly basis. For the simple reason that together the entrepreneur is able to see that his need for finance is not a bunch of forms and not a bunch of rules and regulations of the bank. It really is how to make your business work. Of course, in turn, the bankers expect uh, the mentors and the mentees to ensure that the uh, business is sustainable. I don't talk only in terms of payback, loans, and NPAs, and so on. I talk sustainability in a, in a, in a larger context, but it really makes a difference. And, uh, and of course, in each one of these, we have different types of uh, uh, entrepreneurs. We have innovative entrepreneurs. We have entrepreneurs who are green. Uh, we don't necessarily go in there and say, are you a social entrepreneur, are you an economic entrepreneur, are you a green entrepreneur. We only ask, are you an entrepreneur? Are you a, are a sustainable business? Can you grow? Can you be, go from a job seeker to a job creator? Can you become sustainable? And it's amazing when you start with those fundamentals, many of the ideas they come up with is green, because green is a necessity. And very often they come up with, there's a guy in Haryana who came up and he's come up with a flat panel AC, which is uh, the lowest, uh, uh, you know, Panasonic or uh, LG or anything like that in, in terms of ACs, they are um, 0.5 to 0.8 uh, ton. Here he's producing even smaller than that with no CFC gas whatsoever. Is that innovation? Yes. What's his background? Eight standards. Did he start with saying, I want to be an innovative entrepreneur? No. All he wanted was these flat panel uh, ACs which is mounted on top of uh, individual equipment because people don't mind sitting in a 40 degree room weather or a 45 degree, we are all used to that. But the poor machine is not used to it. So he makes sure that this flat panel AC sits on the sides and cools that down. And, and now the <coughs> India Innovation Inclusive Fund of San Toronto are running after these people saying, wow, that's a great idea, what can you do with that? So the idea is, and here's another guy who, Vaidyanathan, uh, who came up with a way of turning, uh, using a sensor for overhead water tanks. In Chennai, there's a lot of that. And using your mobile to turn it on and off. He has started saving 100,000 liters of water just in the community in which he was operating in. And funnily enough, he's got more orders from Malaysia and Indonesia today than he has from Tamil Nadu itself. I don't know quite what that story is, but he's a happy entrepreneur who's grown and done very well. The other way is we, again, just as we look at it and said as an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur, no matter where you are, uh, in an incubator, a Thai entrepreneur, a Silicon Valley, or a grassroots. Similarly, we said, what are the different kinds of ways and instruments that we give to support these entrepreneurs? So if you look at financial, we've always talked in terms of debt. Have we ever looked at an entrepreneur like Shah Tandale or like uh, Ivaitanathan and said, can you infuse equity in them? Then of course the whole question came, if you give them equity, where is the IPO, where is the m &A, what do you do with that? And he said, well, maybe we can think about it in uh, sharing uh, something in a different way. And this kind of sharing can be where we share with their growth, either the bottom line or top line, revenues or, or, or profits. And uh, that's the way in which, but it gives them enough capital to actually bootstrap their business far better and faster, just like any other equity-based business. And uh, in most of what we do, we are guinea pigs because we are essentially the first one to even try such a thing. In this case, uh, with the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank, seed funding it and other banks, we just started it at the India Innovation Inclusive Fund. We have requested them to run it and they will be managing our fund for us. As I said, essentially when we do this, the replication is very important, the scaling is very important. And the two, two or three things that we need to scale, one, we need the entrepreneurs itself. Two, we need the financing. Three, we need these mentors. And mentors is our uh, backbone, as I said. And uh, Jamshedpur has a very uh, uh, 
especially meaning for me because I performed in this organization with uh, J.R.G. Kaka way back in 92 and he was then 83 and when I had requested him he so very kindly not only came on board I was a chairman, he was such an active chairman he made me uh, you know stand on my feet almost all the time and to make sure that this worked he was my mentor and he made an enormous difference to saying what is fundamentally important and he also said at that time keep the government out Lakshmi we want to do it in the private sector so we did that until last year when we went to Assam and we started realizing that we need to scale up and that new <coughs> models had to be created. So the majority of our mentors come from people like yourselves, people in corporates, people from banks and people from large companies. And the interesting thing is I had seen this model which was really uh, had originated in England from the Prince of Wales. He had started a small program in England and we brought it to India and the success in, in India was such that then other countries, so now we are to 40 countries, not necessarily as Bharti Iva Shakti Trust, but as youth business uh, in each of these countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia and so on and so forth. And everywhere the challenges are the same. It's amazing once a year when we all get together from 40 countries, we all share the challenges of whether it's Brazil or whether it's South Africa or whether it is youth have ideas, youth don't have an ecosystem. Youth have a problem with financing, etc., etc., etc. But the one thing that all of these countries have been coming to India, and we have been training many, many in our own neighborhood as others, is the fantastic mentoring system. And for that, I must say that every time they ask us, what is it about the Indian ethos? Why is it that you people are so um, generous in giving your time, in giving your support? Because we have a network of 3,000 mentors and we are growing it every day. I must say, I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic to hear that. It's, it's good to know that we have the capacity and the capability to be, to give and to take in, in terms of what we can do. So the, the point is, I think again in the previous session, the, the question was raised, are numbers important? At some point, yes. But what is equally important is the stories. What is also equally important is that no one organization is going to make this happen. Nowhere have we came. In fact, Jadi was very clear right from the beginning. He said, if for every person we support, if there are two or three people who can get jobs, that is a good multiplicative factor. Every time we have something called the Jadi Tata Award, we are thrilled to know that many of these people have created jobs for 400 people, 500 people, even 1,000 people. We always feel that the spirit must be extremely happy to hear that. But having said that, what really is needed, we need many, many, many more such initiatives everywhere. And the fact is it can be done because all the ingredients, namely the five the very entrepreneurs are all there in every village, in every rural area as well as urban area. It is just a question of us reaching out to them and making it happen. Thank you so much. Mr. K.C. Mishra. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Because uh, proceeding, uh, before I proceed to my equity initiative, I would like to ask uh, the students from XLRA, how many students are really interested to have a career in social business or social entrepreneurship. Please raise your hands. Yeah, even right now also. So, four. So, what is the reason? Don't you see uh, that uh, there is no career in social business or social enterprise or you don't want to participate directly in the process of social development. Having said so, I would like to contextualize the initiative of equity to the theme of this uh, workshop that is rethinking re development and uh, strengthening the grassroots. It is the need of the hour to have some introspections and to go for some design thinking and redesign the, our approaches the focus as well as the processes to create a scalable impact in the society. And when we are talking about the development, we should ask in the methodology of what, 
how, why, where. And in that process, we have to start introspecting and redesign that which are the issues, which is the gateway to development, which is the approach, is it this approach or that approach, or it is a combination of approaches together. Some people have started, right, everybody is doing their bit and they are really contributing for the society to create some impact. And sanitation as a gateway to development, education as a gateway to development, agriculture as a gateway to development. You know, there, there are different ways of, you know, reaching to the goal of development. And if you see the themes of the last yesterday and till today, in fact, we have, we have reached the last phase of our design, starting with uh, yesterday, self-reliant communities, creating local market, and using the indigenous resources, and finally the entrepreneurship. More or less, we have accepted the fact without productivity, without entrepreneurship, without doing away the process of inefficiency, we can't reach the goal of development. Am I right or wrong? So if that is so, then there is a plenty of opportunities of doing business in this space of social development. So the first focus of equity is redefine the development, look at the issues not only from a philanthropic paradigm, but also from a market driven paradigm or from an enterprise paradigm. That will answer and that will take care of a lot of our existing problems or approaches. Second is, who will do it? Sitting in a boardroom, calling myself as a social entrepreneur, coming out with a new ideas, very good ideas, going to different seminars, workshop, talking about it, is it going to address to the problem? The, what I think as a social entrepreneur needs to be translated at the last road by somebody. It, it may be an individual entrepreneur, it may be a collective enterprise, but if you see the grassroots level, the channels who are providing development and doing development, there is no you know, better organization than cooperatives. If you see the cooperatives, it started longer back in 36, the oldest organizations in India, across the globe for that matter. You look at the cooperatives in developed countries, look at the cooperatives in India. We have not yet start, graduated to the second phase of cooperative. Cooperative has failed. The principles for establishing cooperative is to address to the problem of the cooperative member on its sustainable principles by adopting the principles of business. But it has failed. So many reasons, so many factors, but it has failed. But, you know, we have started redesigning re lot of institutions, self-help group, joint liability group, farmer interest group, so many institutions we have developed in a tiny geographical area where we want to do the development. And let me tell you, coming out with 100 institutions at, at the grassroots level has added one more risk, institutional risk to the poor, poor people. If I am a member of the cooperative, other, other group is not supporting. And let me tell you also very honestly, that's the year of producer organizations, which has been championed by government right now. If you, if anybody has gone through the, the regulatory provision and everything, failure has been inbuilt to that design. I had a discussion with Parvez Sarma and so lot of champions of this, producer companies. Producer companies in Western nations and is nothing but an extension of cooperative. Cooperative has to be graduated to a to, to, to a stage of producer companies. It's not that we have to create a producer companies. And if anybody has understood the power structure of a rural rural setup, cooperators, cooperative will never allow a producer company to operate. We are in the initial step, but it is something 
really pragmatic, it's a fact, everybody has to factor into the system if you want to make producer company a success, successful initiative. And what is the link of the, what exactly we are going to redefine the processes at the grassroots, it has to be a corporative structure, it has to be a corporative process. <laughs> Principles of cooperative has to be integrated with the professionalism of a corporate, then we can make it a success. And keeping all these factors in view, we have designed a model called PI model. PI, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's coincidentally, it's, uh, it has come out to be, you know, a PI, PIE. So P stands for participatory. You have to take the community with you. You have to take the customer with you. It is nothing but an extension of the principles of, our, of your CRM, customer relationship management. You have to take, how big is the rural market? It's a market of 20,000 households, it's maximum 100,000 customers. A couple of entrepreneurs can establish a very good customer relationship management, bring them on board, in all the processes, make it a sustainable, socially responsible supply chain and value chain management system. Is it difficult for an entrepreneur to do it? The next is ICT. In our model, we we are not encouraging any entrepreneur without adopting ICT. Why ICT? Two things. It everybody knows that the transaction cost for providing services to the poor household, especially in the rural area, is very high. Unless the entrepreneur reduces the transaction cost, he will not have a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis others to make it sustainable. So to, to do that, the ICT is a must in our model. And we have designed a lot of analytics. I will elaborate on this in my next in the in my uh, next sequence of my talk, and I said it is a must. Second is transparency. In the development sector, everybody, you know, we trust each other, but absolutely there is no transparency. ICT has got a tremendous power to make everything transparent and connect with everybody. And third is enterprise model, where there is a market, there are customers, there are the product has to be designed, the product has to be made people-centric, prices should be made affordable, and promotion should be word of mouth, low-cost promotion strategy, and start creating that value. Then, what exactly is the system and processes? Here in this model is, there are four critical principles which you have integrated into the system. One is engagement, principles of engagement. Always engage with the people. Don't create a process of alienation between you and the consumer. So the process of engagement, because of lack of process of engagement, a lot of people are not aware of what is happening surrounding them, what are the informations, you know, a lot of informations are not reaching them. So we have adopted the principles of engagement. Second is convergent. If there is an issue, Provide everything in other package to them. For one thing, you will not go to uh, one. Uh, for example, if I am a farmer, I will go for seed to a seed supplier, for fertilizer to a fertilizer supplier, for okay, getting government uh, subsidy to government department, to get bank loan to a bank, to, uh, to, to, to for this advisory to go to different agri universities. You know, it's a hell of a job for me. I know I am a farmer. I know how to plow the land, how to take care of the uh, uh, the raising of the crop. But beyond this, if you want me to go and negotiate with the market, I will not be able to do it. So, everything has to be provided together. This is one of our basic principles. Third is connect. Each issue has to be interpreted or has to be defined in the, in the context of an ecosystem. If it is sanitation, sanitation has got an ecosystem. It is not the only government or it is not the only one NGO, two NGOs, or it is not that one is educational institution, or it will consist of finance people, hardware people, big companies, government, the advocate, advocacy people, the motivational people. 
the country cricket has got an ecosystem we have to connect the dots to make it happen and that can only happen with the help of ICT and fourth is collaborate at the first mile at the back end we should collaborate we should, should have the skill set to collaborate with each other, each other to make it happen and my journey so far I started with agripreneur because in our thinking agriculture is the most important sector which can make the rural economy vibrant and farmer are the change maker it is the farmer if the political people can change can take the help of the farmer to ensure some voting why can't we use the farmer to impact changes in the society so farmer as a change maker is our focus third is I started with agribusiness, giving different type of agribusiness services to the to the farmer. Then, just two two months back, I started vegetarian in the urban cities of Bhubaneswar and the rural areas. Entrepreneurs were encouraging to adopt a good skill set of post harvest management of perishable vegetables and how to have a livelihood out of it and how to uh, have a business opportunities in their rural setup. And third set of entrepreneurs which I have established is Sunny Premier. Sunny Sun and uh, with the help of good player, with a lot of other ecosystem players, we are encouraging that you people are creating a demand, quality of product for poor people should not be compromised, it should be of high quality with an affordable rate and we are encouraging Sunny Premier with the IT solution of Sunny Tool and he is doing business right now and uh, with uh, Joe also we are uh, working together and we are going to create an impact in the state of Orissa in establishing at least 200 Sunny Premier in this calendar year itself and the impact yes uh, uh, Professor Linos uh, his organization, Grameen Indian Social Business, is a partner to me at the international level. Uh, we, are the, we are the domain partner in designing a lot of IT applications. The impact story is uh, quite good, quite encouraging. Farmers are really benefited. They have got access to the information. Who is a little information is adding a lot of value in reducing the cost of input by 17% which has been documented, it is in the public domain and productivity has been increased at least by 50 percent. <laughs> and we are in the process, you know, it's not that it is the end of the story or we have closed all our innovation and initiative and we have established a center of innovation in Bhuvaneswar under equity, engaging lot of young people that you please come, have a career here, do you know what is the Market size, market potential of sanitation in one block. Can anybody tell about this? What is the market opportunity of sanitation in one block? Anybody? 10 crores. Orissa has got the potential of 3,230 crores. It's very simple calculations. In one block, especially where I am doing it, 23,000 households are there. If you take the government claim that 70% of the household have the toilet, 14,000. Each toilet cost is 10,000 on an average. What is the size? Can you not make a career out of it? Can an entrepreneur make a livelihood out of it? Yes or no? Do you know the market size of an agribusiness? One acre of land with one crop, one small farmer gives an earning opportunity of rupees 500. Am I right or wrong? Anybody has, can dispute or anybody? 500 rupees, one acre of land, one crop in a year. And in one block, more than five to 6,000 acres of land, which it cannot provide. So we have confined to some at least 1000 acres of land, beyond that he cannot give. Imagine the 
market size. This is the social market. What we have to do is lot of scope for innovation. We have to design the product properly, package it properly, promote it properly, and do a do a business ethically and in a socially responsible way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mishra. Now, Mr. Dura. Good afternoon, friends. I'm very privileged to be standing here today and share my thoughts on entrepreneurship at the grassroots level. I want to share with you our experiences and also a part of my personal experiences on how entrepreneurship can be promoted in each individual's life. If we look at the topic of promoting entrepreneurship at the grassroots, I would like to think that the Andalus father who started out in life as a petrol pump oil delivery man and had built an empire. At some point of time, he can be considered as entrepreneur, an entrepreneur at the grassroots level. If you look at Henry Ford, he used to work in a watch company, and at night he would work with his automobile spare parts, and he developed the Ford Motors Company. If you look at Sony, one of the first brand names for Japanese industry in the world. They started out in the backyard. And Aki Morita and his friends, they failed in manufacturing a pressure cooker, electric cooker. If you look at Honda company, Yoshiro Honda started with trying to improvise motorbikes by seeing that Japanese couldn't afford a good motorbike. But he believed that Japanese economy needed, needed to be changed after the Second World War because everyone would you know, go to work on a bicycle. Just like I saw this morning as I came from the train, I saw hundreds of people on bicycle. The taxi driver told me that they have cycles for about two and a half hours, 30 kilometers away from here to work in Natanaga. Now, way back in the 40s, Japanese decided that their people need to be transported faster so that productivity improves. And that's the story of Honda Company. And therefore, we have enough examples here in the country as well. And today, the slide that has been shown to us by Lakshmi about the bottom where you talk about income generating, and then you come up to self-employed, and at the top, you have entrepreneurs. I find that depicts a lot of what I'm going to share today. But just before I go to our experiences, I wanted to give you a background of where I come from. Because I see that not many people are from the part of the world that I'm here today. And this morning, one of the newspapers was giving a headline report about how a young boy from Arunachal was killed in Delhi because of the common called Chinky. Uh, maybe he got offended for me, I do not really get offended even if people call me Chinky. But therefore I want to give you a just brief background on the type of situation that we work in. You know, North, if you look at Northeast itself, Northeast occupies about 8% of the total land mass of the country with a population of about 4%. And if you talk about diversity in our subcontinent, then out of you know, 533 tribes in India, about 209 are in Northeast. Out of 365 languages spoken in India, uh, 175 languages are spoken in Northeast. And therefore, you can't really uh, assess Northeast in the way that many people think that Northeast is similar. It is not. I come from a place called Nagaland, as 
Professor Sen has introduced. About, about 45% of Naga land went to Burma in 1953. And 55% went to India in 1953. And it was further divided, the, those areas which went to India was further divided into four administrative zones. One zone went to Arunachal, one zone went to Assam, one zone went to Manipur. The zone that I come from is called Nagaland. And that you know, is in an area of about 16,500 square kilometers. Now, Nagaland is the only state I am told that has been brought into a statehood by a political agreement, not by merger or by accession. And till today, since 1947 to 14 ago, in Trisni, Nagaland, people still celebrate Nagaland Independence Day. And therefore, you have political setups where we call parallel governments. So we come from a situation where you have underground governments which openly float as popular governments. You also have governments, popular governments operating there. And therefore, business people like us, we have to pay multiple taxations. Therefore, in Nagaland, in spite of, I will not go into the particular turmoil that has been seen in just independence, but because of these multiple tax regimes, no national company would like to set foot in Nagaland. Forget about multinational companies. Therefore, over the last 60 years, the state government has been the only provider of employment in Nagaland. The official statistics show that we have a population of 19.8 lakhs, whereas the actual population is hardly 15 lakhs. Out of this 15 lakhs population, we have an employment of 1 lakh 20,000 people employed in the state. This makes the highest woman employment ratio in India with about 80 or uh, employment age. So, this is extremely high, but if you don't get a government job, there is hardly any opportunity. And that's where young people like us, I am now about 40 years old, when we were in our late 20s, we decided to question what why things are not happening, why there is no entrepreneurship here. And we started to question why people are used to easy money. But because of the peculiar situation we were in, the government had started interesting uh, schemes. One of the schemes was known as K2 scheme. Till that was in force till 1988. If you pass on the plus 10, then anyone can get a contract for up to 50,000 without any DPR or without being registered as a contractor. Therefore, any young boy or girl who passed the last 10 had on their lap 50,000 for any damn contract works. Therefore, slowly a number of youths, educated youths, began to get used to this type of easy money. And therefore, for me, when I passed out my class 10 in 1919 and came to Bohima, the capital of Nagaland, I found young people not willing to do manual jobs, which was quite amusing because I'm from the village. And therefore, I decided that we need to challenge this. People were not willing to work hard. Easy money was plenty. And if you want government job, government job also was plenty. And therefore, we formed ourselves into what we call Beacon of Hope. And I was one of the first, in fact, I was the first to sell ice cream in Kohima because Kohima is very deeply old. So in 1992, we first sold ice cream for two rupees. Housewives would manufacture such ice creams in their fridge, and I used to get 55 paisa commission. We formed a group, a number of us went through the street to sell newspapers. Some girls be, uh, were the first to be as uh, waitresses in the hotels. And we tried our best to change the idea of the mindset of the society that easy money is not right. And having said that, we thought that 
we will say no to government job, which was plenty. And so, I also turned down a government job. My other friends turned down a government job, and I, I got two years in the college in economics, and I realized that I need to become a shopkeeper. I took a loan of 25,000 rupees at 4% per month, which was compounded every three months, because no banks were willing to give loan to us in 1988. I was out with an MA economics. I was a lecturer in a college with good pay, but I couldn't get 25,000 loan. And in 12 months, the interest which was compounded every month was more than the capital. That kept me thinking for a long time. And the shop that I developed for two years, suddenly on December 4th, 1999, it was burned down to ashes. And we never came to know who did it. But at that time, I decided that I would take my decision to resign from my job. People said, this is nuts. Because people would look down upon anyone who takes up entrepreneurial activity apart from skinner government job. So if you are a postgraduate student, people would think that you would come back home with a government registered vehicle as a government officer. And as I said, it was plenty in those days. <coughs> Even today, the banking scenario has not really changed, although we have worked for about 15 years. We have had several business meets with banks. We do collaborate and work with banks, but banks still have their own reason why they do not do business in that country. And I will just, December 31st, 2013, bank report says that their CTR is at 33%, which is below Bihar. But if you take out SBI, which is the lead bank, and most of it, their SBI loans go to government servants, because government pay is with the true SBI. And if you take out NABAS, which is not a commercial bank. If you take out the cooperative bank, which is not a commercial bank, the commercial banks all put together, their CDR is hardly 15%. And therefore, in such a scenario, we decided that we not only need to promote entrepreneurship, but we need to promote finances. And so in 2000, we started with a small capital of 7,000 rupees. Today, I'm proud to tell you that we have an NPC which we operate from Jamshed Gold and we are specialized on SME finances. Now that's what we call entrepreneurship at the grassroots level. Therefore, today, if we challenge the youth, nothing is grassroots because we are in information age. <laughs> you look at Google, you look at Amazon. You look at Yahoo, they were all the youngsters, unemployed, suddenly they became billionaires. Therefore, if we want to talk about entrepreneurship, it is a paradox whether an entrepreneur can be really at the grassroots level, level with a stage of growth like people, people like us, who took 10 years to reach at the scale where we are. But I want to encourage people who would like to do business that we do not depend on capital for our business. Although I am aware that we need capital, we have financed and mentored successfully about 2,000 youths. We have mentored over 4,000 youths on self-entrepreneurship, self-employment and entrepreneurship, but 2,000, a little over 2,000 are successful and they are doing very well. For instance, one person by name Pewetel, a class 5 student, dropped out. He came to me in 2005 and asked for about 20,000 rupees to start a small pan shop. Today, he does, by the way, he doesn't know how to read and write properly. He can sign, but he doesn't know how to read and write properly. This guy today employs about 15 people and saves 2,000 rupees every day. One of my friends, business friends today, Zaren Bodio, he came to us in 2003 for 50,000 loan. Today he employs 145 people with multiple cross 
turnover every year. And therefore, if we look at back on, on what entrepreneurship is, I would like to think that entrepreneurship at the grassroots level has no ecosystem, has no business ecosystem. For instance, in our situation, banks are still today not going to do business with us. I'm a businessman, and I can, to my own extent, I can say I'm successful, but you'll be surprised that I don't have a credit card. In Nagaland, Axis Bank gives credit card. If you put a deposit of one lakh rupees, they will give you a credit card of 80,000 rupees, <laughs> which is our <laughs> trust. And therefore, we have that scenario. Therefore, the meaning of credit card is lost. So we don't have our business ecosystem in place. We Nagaland is connected by five flights a day, uh, a week. Probably it's one of the only neglected airports in the country. And that is because Air Force wants to have training over the fly zone. Therefore, they don't allow other uh, aircraft to fly on the Dimapur Strait zone. They have to come way around like that. And therefore, a lot of times we fly from Kakata to Dimapur, which is hardly one hour flight. I have flown a lot of times paying 15,000, 40,000 rupees. And we operate in such a situation, we have bad roads, we have bad electricity, we have conflict situation where we have multiple tax regime. And therefore, it boils down to the person who wants to create a change. If you want to be an entrepreneur, no one can stop you. You have to be an entrepreneur because you have no capital. We don't depend on market. We entrepreneurs create market. We don't need the ecosystem. We need an idea and a trust. The will to succeed by any means. And so from the street where I sell newspaper, where I have sold pens, books, cups, spoons. I have come to learn that street skills are very important, although they may not be taught in Harvard and Excel In 1994, when I was graduating, I really wanted to join Excel And I didn't know how to apply. So I wrote a letter to Excel saying that I am so and so in a Shengdu tribe from Nagaland, and I would like to get help. You know, uh, admission form. Of course, as you would expect, I never got the reply. <laughs> but I'm so happy to come today and speak in Excellent Live. <laughs> so, and tell you, and tell the brightest business students here that in business, what we want to do, what you think is the best answer for society, unless we sell a good product, we cannot succeed in business. And therefore, what we need is honesty. What we need is hard work. What we need is that you must believe in yourself. If you can have this product, which is going to be useful to society, no matter what people tell you, if you are going to believe in yourself. And what we have seen, because we give loan to a number of hundreds, in fact thousands of shopkeepers, we keep on telling them that learn to smile. Optimism. Chinese said that, there is a Chinese saying, if you cannot smile, do not become a shopkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> And so we tell our shopkeepers to please stand up when customers come, smile at them, even if you don't want to smile, never argue with your customers, you know, say thank you a lot, never cheat your suppliers and your customers. And if one is willing to put a little bit of hard work, everyone will succeed. That's what entrepreneurship will do. And I tell you, entrepreneurship will definitely change the country. I think India has lost lots of time thinking that socialism, thinking that public sector uh, ventures 
will solve our economic needs. In 1991, when the present Prime Minister, when he was the Finance Minister, and Narash Rao, they introduced LPG. Not the booking just which is being talked now, but as you know, uh, liberalism, privatization, and globalization. When they introduced that, a shift from the Indian economics, it has created such fast changes all over. And that's why today we are able to talk about entrepreneurship. I want to encourage each and every young youth, not only here, but across the country, that we do need entrepreneurs. And if America is not ashamed to say that it's a capitalist economy and driven by entrepreneurs, why should India be ashamed? Thank you.
you know, ground realities of successful entrepreneurship which Mr. Dolo has uh, unfolded. Mr. Dolo was talking about the very poor performance of the banking system there. I was provoked here. He, the average population per bank office in Nagaland is larger, is higher than the average population per bank office in the entire country. That is for, you know, you know there is one branch for 14,000 people across the country, but there is a branch for less than 12,000 people in Nagaland. And yet, what he said is true that the CD ratio hovers around 30%, and which he said quite rightly is below the CDR of Bihar. But then I think Mr. Dolo would agree, and he had also mentioned that in a different way, in different ways, that one reason why banks are conservative in uh, making fresh loans there is that the recovery performance is very poor. Whatever they had lent in the past, the major part of the money had not come back. And the recovery performance in, in the entire country, the average is 50%. The average in Nagaland would be less than 30%. This is something which discourages the banks to make fresh loans. Because all of you would agree that the banks live on others' money. People who park deposits with the banks, they keep the funds in trust and they have to get back the money. So therefore, when the banks lend, they have to make sure that the money comes back to them. And for some reason or the other, the recovery performance in Nagaland is very poor. And I think here, Mr. Duolo and all others who are well wishers of Nagaland, they must try and ensure that the recovery performance looks up. And I'm sure, as a former bank man, I am very sure that if the repayment percentage is better, you know, there is no reason why the bank men there would keep their shops open and will not lend. So that is, you know, one PESA uh, contribution from my side regarding the poor performance of the banking system, you know, in uh, Nagaland. In Nagaland, he had talked about you know, some areas where business can, you know, thrive. You know, in the interesting thing I would like to share with you, whenever I went to Nagaland, you know, people, I met the Vice Chancellor or some other dignitaries of Nagaland University as a board member. Now, they would present me with not natural flowers, but bouquet of artificial flowers. Because it's very difficult to grow most of the flowers there in Nagaland, given the agroclimatic conditions, given the temperature there. Now, why not, you know, we try to develop this flower making as one of the you know, viable uh, entrepreneurial uh, enterprise there. And Mr. Duolo would agree with me that Lyshampi of different kinds are very popular across the world. And Lyshampi, very interesting, he, 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 referred, he, he pointed out that there are very many tribes which live in Nagaland. Now each tribe has its own pattern in the Lyshampi. Now these Lyshampis, if they are, you know, made in a, in a larger scale, if they can link up with institutions like, you know, Fab India, I think this will be a very big business at the grassroots level. So our Northeast, our Nagaland has great prospects for business, great prospects for entrepreneurship. I think there is a need for some kind of introspection for people like Mr. Duolo, then there is no reason why Nagaland will lag behind some other states of the country. Thank you. And now the house is open for question and answer. Um, hi, my name is Pallavi. I'm from Startup. Um, I firstly want to congratulate uh, all the speakers for a wonderful session because this is a topic that's very close to my heart and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, my question is for Lakshmi and Ishade, both of you, I, either of you can answer it. Um, I believe that uh, failure needs to be embraced in the same way as we embrace successful entrepreneurs. So in your cases, um, 
how did you uh, handhold uh, entrepreneurs who probably did fail because I mean all of us see failure. So what was the kind of handholding and mentoring that these uh, uh, entrepreneurs got? And is there a follow-up process that, that or a tracking process that you have in place in terms of when they start their uh, enterprises? How do you track them over a certain period of time? Thank you. Um, that's a really good question because uh, one of the things that perhaps in India we don't do enough is celebrate failures. We celebrate only successes. Uh, that is why when we go even to uh, raise awareness about what entrepreneurs and invite the young people to become entrepreneurs, we take our existing entrepreneurs and they are the ones, best ones to tell their story. Like he told his story about what it took to uh, get to some place. And everybody's story is filled with failures of any number of things. It could be failure that they, how they lost. Sharad Tandale was an example of someone who after six months almost lost his business. And uh, because he had promised more than he should, the Pune Municipal Corporation came in back and told him, you know, exactly you, you gave all of these uh, specifications and you've not come up to it. He thought he could put something on paper and do something else. And the mentor was behind him to say, no, that cannot be done. But he was not listening. Sometimes that can also happen. You can have all the advice in the world. And your mind is saying, uh, you know, it's just filtering it out. So in this case, he had to be hit on the head before he realized those specifications meant something. He really had to live up to that. And today, he's the one when he subcontracts is telling others, you better know what is it you're putting down on paper and what you're promising. So almost every one of them have failed. Another one almost lost his job. He let the business go for a while, went and got himself a, a, a regular job, made up some money, came back, paid the bank so that the bank will not be after him calling him an MPA and restarted his business. And through it all, this advice and this mentoring and that kind of thing. It, it's just like, I mean, you talk about any tech entrepreneurs, whether they are in biotech or in IT, they will tell you any number of things they failed at. So failure, we believe, is an integral part. And peer mentoring, mentoring with people who know it, and even being able to understand from financial institutions, uh, understanding the process, is all part of being able to cope with that failure. Yeah, oh, you want to Sure. Um, I'll quickly answer. I was at my talk today. Uh, but just before going there, I just wanted to take on from what Professor Sen said about banks in Nagaland. It's not to debate what, what banks are doing there, because we do a lot of time. We work with SBI, we work with, we have worked with ICICI, XCs, and other few other good banks there. So we know what it is. But the poor recovery in Nagaland is to do with a lot of ills inside the bank then rather outside with the customers. And uh, I won't go into the details. I'll just tell you that an application for SBI loan application in one of the districts cost 5,000 rupees. Just application loan, that's outside the market. And most of the loan defaults are not in the names of Nagas. We've done the research and we found out that actually the name could be Panemi, Nagas name, but here, manager or the one who took loan is a loan number. And the banks do actually know it exactly well before they have sanctioned four cross loan or two cross loan to that enterprise. Therefore the banking situation in Nagaland needs to be changed. And we have taken this matter to the Standing Parliamentary Commission on Finance. But the banks are yet to act because they see Nagaland as a deposit hub rather rather than a credit destination. And so there's a situation where entrepreneurship has to grow. Now I bought the flowers, I think that's a very good example. Nagaland is doing extremely well on flower. Nagas are ex exporting, you will be surprised that we export lithium to Bangkok uh, Island. And we export a lot of lithium and other flowers, which I can't remember the name as of now, but lithium I know, they're due to uh, Delhi. So I think you're right, a lot of opportunities are there and this Businesses are handled by women, and so they are doing extremely well. 
going to the uh, question, I would agree with Lakshmi. Everything is part of failure. Even for our own organization, we have lost several crores in 2006, 7, 8. Because at that time, the microfinance activity was at its zenith. Only it fell from 2008 onwards. And so banks really gave us loan. Without doing due diligence, we gave up loans to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, and we couldn't recover. So as an organization, we lost several crores. I keep on meeting every day, almost every day, shopkeepers, entrepreneurs who have failed. And just some two weeks ago, I met one of a good members of ours. He had lost about one crore rupees, and he was almost in tears. We had a tough time of discussing for about one hour, and he went away happy. Today, his business is improving. And within these two weeks, it is improving because now he has the hope to succeed. And therefore, failures are part of our success. And so if we, but the important thing is not to get overwhelmed by failures. I think as entrepreneurs, a lot of times we have to let go of our losses. Never discuss about our losses, but only dream of the big money, of the big game that you are going to make at the end of the road. And with that optimism, it will help us to reach that destination faster. Mr. That's the last question. Yeah, this question, hi, I'm, I'm Ravi Sina. This question is to Lakshmi, but could be very well answered by anyone. Uh, like you, Lakshmi, I love Kalyan for some of the words which he used, the proto. But he also said, all your entrepreneurs, we go to school and then it's all over. Then we have four hands from XLRI with 400 students here who want to become an entrepreneur and that's because somebody asked that question. Maybe actually there are no hands. There's one Kumar Ankit sitting here who became an entrepreneur here and how many of them are there? So what is that ecosystem which, and he used a brilliant trade, easy money. The job which is an easy money. So somewhere in the process that safe risk averse education system, how do we break that in your ecosystem which you are saying is actually before the pre higher education level which is where entrepreneurship is probably growing, the idea is growing and then it gets nipped in the bud. So any reflection on that? It's uh, very interesting. Uh, two years ago uh, there was a conference in uh, Australia and uh, one of the, uh, and I was an invited speaker and what they wanted to know was how Australia could become more entrepreneurial and lessons from BYSD, I first thought it was rather a strange uh, thing because they were not talking about grassroots entrepreneurship, they were talking about entrepreneurship. And one of the first things that I had learned through all this whole process, because I myself came from the corporate sector and I didn't really know, I mean, I wasn't an entrepreneur to begin with, is that entrepreneurship, education takes the entrepreneurial spirit out of the individual. And this is being said, I learned in that Australia conference, this is being said throughout the world. It's not that our system alone. Even in America, you talk about the fact that uh, uh, you know, Harvard graduate goes to Wall Street, not necessarily someone who starts it. Maybe an MIT graduate or a Caltech or somebody else would do it, but not. So everywhere it is clear that a very um, sort of structured education system is not necessarily today conducive. The 20th century education system has not been conducive to necessarily being an entrepreneur. But having said that, you are absolutely right. If you look at someone amongst, we don't put any kind of preconditions. You can be a standard educated, you can be college educated, you can be an engineer. We essentially look at grassroots from the underprivileged perspective. And without putting any restrictions, we find that by and large, it is the people from the, uh, the high school graduate or even the vocational skills whose mind is already ticking in a practical way. There are any n number of college graduates who say, 
we'd love to be an entrepreneur. Can you tell us what to do? And we are looking at them and say, I have no idea. You are the entrepreneur. You please tell us what you want to do. And similarly, when we do this business idea contest, by and large, there are not, we have done it in colleges and we have done it in general uh, public in the grassroots. Invariably, those 800, 900 ideas are coming out of here, whereas what we do in specific colleges tends to be minimized. So, if I don't think I have a crystal ball to say exactly what to do, does it mean that therefore we don't go to college or we don't become an engineer and that's the no, that's not the reason. The idea is that perhaps we need to look at and I am dead against entrepreneurship education as a course. Please teach entrepreneurship, but by telling them go start a business and at the end of the semester you've got to make a profit. I don't care if you go and sell ice cream even though you're an XLRI graduate or whatever it is. But at the end of it, you have to have show that your business plan works. Rather than sit in the classroom and say, entrepreneurship 101, you need to know more this thing, these are the motivational characters. There are even people who use psychological parameters for, for um, uh, selecting the entrepreneurs. We have stayed away from all of that. Because we have said, as a mentor, you talk to an entrepreneur, if you don't know that the person, if you can't gauge, just like you would in a HR uh, field in a company, if you can't gauge that the person has entrepreneurial spirit or the skills, then it's nothing that you're going to do with all these tests and all these examinations. So don't give exams, don't give any kind of uh, psychological test, give them a practical problem. If they solve it, then they are an entrepreneur. I think we, uh, we should close it here. I know many of you have questions. And you can ask the questions in the lunch time, but Angit, the last question. Yeah. I, I, I have an answer for the, for the way. Mm -hmm. yeah, answer for, for the whole, whole ecosystem which we are talking about. As if everybody is out here that education and entrepreneurship are conflicting. That's what you would take. But I have a slightly different take. As in, what did you study in a school? You studied marketing one. What do you do? We do a marketing plan for a PMG. We do a capex, we do a capex for any 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 damn company. We do advertising solution, we do for some years. I have a simple model which I practiced in my 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 journey, which could be practiced anywhere, which could be practiced across universities. What do you do? Maybe I've i told this time and again to all my faculty, but it has not been instructed. It's a sorry state that this conference is one of the biggest conferences across the country. But apart from Sigma guys, I'm sure nobody out from the normal two year courses out here. What do you do right now is that right from the ideation session as an induction program, you have a 15 day induction program. What do you do? You ask the students, you come with an idea. If you don't have an idea, do an ideation workshop for the next 15 days. What do you do then? Don't have a course on entrepreneurship. Just ask them, build out an idea for the next two years. You have a marketing one, do a marketing plan for your company. You have an ASP, do an ASP for yourself. Do a CapEx, do it for yourself. 80% of the time goes in products. If that 80% of the time can go in building your idea, you can take a call after 18 months. In that case, education and entrepreneurship will not be conflicting. We anywhere study everything, but we don't implement. So my appeal to all of my faculty and etc. probably if they can take a call that how we can support entrepreneurship in the true spirit, then this is the this is my way, is my answer to the whole issue. I think the education and entrepreneurship is not conflicting at all. You're absolutely right. But if you do it in a practical way at the end of it, that's what I finished by saying, if at the end of it you have actually run a business, then you know you're an entrepreneur. That's the only subject, not passing exams. You're absolutely right. Now. No, sir. Uh, before we break for lunch, uh, I request Professor Pravansi to give me the windows and the open of acquisition. Mr. Casey Mishra. And Mr. Duolo. Ladies and gentlemen, we are running quite behind time, which I think is okay. But I think we also need to catch up. May I request uh, by this slot if we are back by 2.15? Uh, yeah, one Thank you.
Yeah, uh, one more thing. Uh, we have the registry for the registration here. Uh,